everyone sitting comfortably. Now I'll begin. The, I'm going to talk about this butterfly later, but just so you've got something, something to feast your eyes on. Um, I've got it up while I talk, but I was going to talk a bit generally at first um, about generally about butterflies as well as specifically about butterflies in the park. In, in, in the UK, they were reckoned to have 58 kinds of butterfly which either appear permanently or migrate here regularly. Um, and of those, we, over, the, over the course of time, we've seen 30 of them in the cemetery park, probably six or seven of them only once or twice. So, but we've still got a very good tally. Um, some of you probably were here. I did a spring talk on butterflies. Some, some of you were probably here then. Um, in the spring, there's about 13 kinds of butterfly that you might find in the park. But in the, in the, in the season we're just coming to, it, it's more like, well, up to about 23 or 24. There, there are more kinds flying in the summer. Um, most of, some of them, are, are actually repeats of the ones that we saw in the spring. They've had another brood and they've come out again. The only, the only exception, that the only butterfly we've got in the spring that we don't have in the summer is the orange tip, which will be familiar to quite a lot of people. But I wanted to sort of say, well, a few more general things. One, I think one thing to say, one thing you can say about butterflies is that although they can be elusive, you know, you, what's that flashing past me they can also be very visible to watch you know like that speckled wood sitting there you, you'd be able to watch everything that it did when it was on what looks like hawthorn blossom i think that picture um but you'd be able to see how it's holding its wings you'd be able to count its spots if you wanted to and that's the the um you'd also be able to see its proboscis uncurled and going into the flower for the nectar and you could look under, maybe you could even glimpse what's underneath because it'd be quite different than what's on top. Um, one, one thing I noticed is something I've only just, le only just learnt by mugging up a little bit in my books on something, is that speckled wood, when you see there's spots on the hind wings of the speckled wood, apparently sometimes there are three and sometimes there are four. And the two, they're not different kinds, but they have some differences in how they behave with, according to whether they've got three spots or four. But I'll, I'll come back onto that later. Anyway, you, you can sort of see that when that butterfly is settled, you can see it very well, which is more easily perhaps than you can watch something like a bee or a fly, which move, moves faster. Um, you, you can not, but you can not only look at butterflies when they're settled, you can also look at them when they're flying and I think I can confidently say that every kind of butterfly that we, we have in the park, every single one has sort of a way of flying which is not identical to any of the others. So when you, when you really get to know them, you can pick up all kinds of funny differences. And sometimes it's enough just to see how one's flying. You, you know what it is, even if you can't see any of the colours. So. You, you can actually watch butterflies very closely. The one, one thing to say is if you want to, if, if you see a butterfly which might be settled on the ground and it, it might have its wings opened or closed and sometimes when they're, op when they're open, it's a way of getting warmer if it's nice and sunny, uh, spreading your wings. Um, but you, you, uh, what you need to do is you need to approach carefully if you see a butterfly that's on the ground or it's on a flower. What the, the first rule is don't rush to get close to it. The, the second rule is don't cast a shadow on it, no matter what you do. The moment you cast a shadow, it'll be up and off. So you, you get as close as you can and so, some will let you get closer than others. I, and one of my most memorable experiences actually was when I was, uh, uh, myself and Andy, who's joined us tonight, we were in France on an extremely hot day, desperately hot, about, about 37 degrees, 36, 37 degrees. We, we were in an oak forest and there were huge numbers of a butterfly called a purple hair streak, hundreds and thousands of them. 
they, they normally spend their time in the treetops and quite a few butterflies spend a lot of their time in the treetops so it's not easy to see them but on that very hot day they'd come down and they were resting on resting on bushes underneath the big oak trees and Andy is a very keen photographer with all the kit um, and he started trying to take pictures of these butterflies and he knew how to approach them very carefully but whenever he got his lens within a certain distance probably about a meter even though he was being very careful that they, they would they would all they would all they would fly off so what he had to do was get a longer lens and only then was he able to photograph them now that kind of sensitivity is quite remarkable and not quite seen anything like it since but anyway you know you approach butterflies carefully and you can see a lot um the the Butterflies we're getting at this time of year, I said we're getting a lot, we're getting a lot more kinds than we get in the spring. Um, but just at this very moment, during the 15th, we, we're actually at the bottom of the summer flight period. That, that if you've been in the park lately, you won't have seen very many butterflies. Um, you'll, you'll have seen a few, but and the reason you won't have seen very many is that the spring, the spring ones, which are going to reappear again, they're going to reappear again because they've had another brood. They've gone through egg, caterpillar, chrysalis. And they're only just now beginning to, to sort of get that far. But, but butterflies will rapid, from now on, butterflies should rapidly increase. And in a month's time, they'll be, you know, flying in great numbers. But at the moment, it's a low ebb. The, the other thing is that the one, there are others that we, you don't see in the spring. That's because they spend the winter perhaps as an egg or as a small caterpillar. And it takes them until about mid, the middle or late June or even into July before they've finished their development. So they're not ready yet. So the, at the moment, you'll probably get, you'll be lucky if you see half a dozen kinds if you go around the park at present. But very soon you'll see many more. So um that's a bit about the park but a bit about butterflies globally um the the one of one of the people will ask you know what's the difference between a butterfly and a moth well won't go into the whole of that but one of the thing that, that, that there are sort of more than 90 percent of all the different kinds of butterflies and moths are actually moths that there are there are only seven sort of families of moths worldwide um, but there are hundred no sorry only seven families of butterflies worldwide but 129 of moths so moths hugely outnumber butterflies most of them fly at night as we know but a, a few four or five percent perhaps of moths fly by day and we've got some of those in the cemetery park but the uh, and a very 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 few butterflies across the world fly only at night but that's a mere handful that you know so butterflies are nearly all day day flyers um the the uh, it, somebody might I, I talk about the technical differences between the two but but a general guide is that if if you see um you can see that speck of wood there the antennae you can make out that they thicken towards the tip they're clubbed um I mean, all, all butterflies have clubbed antennae and only very limited number of moths. They generally don't have, you know, they, they have antennae that don't end in a club. They might be feathery, they might not be feathery. So that's, that's butterflies and moths. Now let me just check my, where I'm up to here. Um, what I was going to say too is that, you know, I hope this talk will, will enable you to recognise a lot of what you might see, but... You know, I think that a you know there's a hell of a lot you can you can find out just by looking, and you can look at butterflies pretty well. Um, and also, butterflies are, are, are by far the most researched group of insects. There's been a tremendous amount of research on them. So often, how they live and hypotheses about you know what certain things signify, how they how they enable 
butterflies to, you know, why they're important to the butterfly. Um, there's a mass and a tremendous amount of research. It's, it's sort of endless. Some of it's been done for the sake of it because but butterflies are so popular, but much of it, butterflies have been one of the key tools in understanding genetics as well. And that's, uh, that's been a motive, a scientific motive for studying them. Um, now, look, check this out. I think that's... Uh, what I'll do now is I'll start to talk about the butterflies themselves. And I'm going to start with this one, the speck of wood. Um, this, this one, if you're at all familiar with the park and you keep your eye out for butterflies, you will probably have seen this one. Uh, the, the, the best place to look for it is, is not where you might expect. You don't look for it out in the open fields, although you may sometimes see it there. You look for it in the woods. And above all, you look for it where there's a patch of sunlight falling into the woodland. That's where male speckled woods very often hang out. Um, the, the, um, and, and when they do, what, what they're doing, what, what, what you'll see, you'll almost all be males. I think that, that, that happens with most of the butterflies. You see far more males than you see females. As the females, males are sort of, flaunting themselves, they're moving, they're often moving around a lot or they're behaving in a conspicuous manner. P females are not. What, once they've mated, their ends in life are one, to lay eggs, two, to nectar, to keep themselves, keep themselves fed and that's about it. But the males are constantly on the lookout for females. The, the, um, the, the speckled wood, is a butterfly that you can, you could see in the cemetery park or anywhere else. In principle, you could see it on any day of the year from sometime in March, late March, until early November. Um, th this is unusual that a butterfly is present so constantly and there's a special reason for it. it it's because it's, it's the only butterfly that we've got in this country that has two different ways of spending the winter. So, some of them pass the winter as caterpillars and they don't come out to be flies until about middle of May. But others pass the winter as a chrysalis and they come out from the end of March. So when, when sort of one lot goes, another lot starts. There, there are a few of those around at the moment, not, not many, but a few. And at some, some points in the summer, you might see lots of them. The, the, um, I did, a, I, I'm going to probably talk more about the speckled wood than about any other kind of butterfly because I thought, well, you know, it's particularly interesting in various ways. Um, one, of, one of the things that I didn't know until I started mugging up a bit more is that although where you see them is usually in these little sunny spots in the woods, um, but apparently they're quite often not there. They're right up in the treetops because um, uh, apparently that that's the best place to look for females that they 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 don't they they're what they call patrollers when they do that that they're, they're they're moving around looking for females but when when you see one in a in a sunny spot in the woods you'd call that a, a percher it, it's staying in one spot looking at passing females and and seeing off any any other males so so speckled woods can be both patrollers and perchers and and they can apparently change their behavior if if you get a um if the weather's very warm they don't need the warmth that they get by basking in a sunny spot in the woods they, they can go up into the canopy where it's cooler um but but if if it cools down a bit they don't get enough heat up there and they've got to come down to bask, bask in a sunny spot and build up their body temperature. Apparently they've got to, they regulate themselves to get a temperature of 32 to 35 degrees centigrade, which is almost as much as us. And they, they can't do that just from the ambient atmosphere. They can only do it from, you know, basking and absorbing sunlight. So, so I, I learned that, you know, we probably, there may be a lot more speckled woods in the park than, than, than any of us ever see, because many of them may be up and away, totally out of our sight. When, when they're up there, one of the things they do is pe people have heard of honeydew, I think, which is the, 
the sticky sugary stuff that aphids produce now, quite a lot of butterflies drink that and some some almost aren't interested in flowers and they they drink only that or nearly only that but the speckled wood does both it'll go on the flowers as you see here but apparently it it when it's up in the treetops it often is taking taking um honeydew so the, the um what i learned one thing I, I mentioned earlier about three spots and four spots on the bottom and this is what i didn't know now what where's my facts on that let me just check i've, I've learned that so recently i don't even remember it it's uh yeah uh if if a butterfly has got four spots on the wing it's more likely to be a percher and stay in a sunny spot if it's got three it's more likely to be a patroller this isn't this is not absolute but it shows the kind of detailed research that's been done on butterflies somebody has sat, sat there for hour after hour day after day counting the spots on the wings seeing what the butterfly did making notes and then doing statistics and coming up with that conclusion so you know make of that what you like um, you, you might think it's a waste of human endeavor. You might think it's, you know, it's a fascinating insight and might be important for some other reason. It's certainly, a, you know, it, it, it helps to, under, you know, it's a start towards understanding the significance of the spots. Um, one, one of the things about the spots though, and quite a lot of butterflies have spots like this. And what, what's regarded as one of their primary roles is in protecting the butterfly from birds and lizards because the bird or lizard is pretty likely instead of actually going for the body to go for one of those eyes um, and when they do the butterfly can very often escape and, and you quite often do see butterflies with an eye spot pecked out you know you can see where it's gone you can see the gap so they've got an important you know they've got an important survival value as well as looking pretty but the, the um, uh, speckled, speckled woods belong to one a group of butterflies called the browns they they there are 11 kinds of brown butterfly in the British Isles three of them we will never see in the park because they're almost exclusively found in Scotland they're really northern butterflies they're butterflies of cool climates um, there's one called the Scotch Argus, one called the Mountain Ringlet, um, one called the, um, what's the other one, the Large Heath. But, so the, the great bulk of their populations is found in Scotland, so they really do not, you know, they, they do not go well with the warmer weather. It, in fact, on a global significance, that there's quite a lot of butterflies, small in relation to the total number, but there's quite a lot found only north of the Arctic Circle believe it or not, where obviously, you know, how the hell they, you know, how they manage their life is quite a, quite a tricky business. Um, in fact, there's even, there's even one called the polar fritillary, which lives in North Greenland, among other places. You think, how can a butterfly live in North Greenland? How is it possible? But it is. Um, so we've got, we've got 11 of these butterflies um, in the, in the UK. We've seen six of them over time in the cemetery park. So speckled wood is one, and we perhaps maybe move the slide onto another one now, onto the next one. Yeah, can Ken hear me? Can we? Yeah, there we go. Right. What we've got here is is another of the um, is another brown. That, oh, we'll go back to the gate key. Yeah. The, this this is called the gatekeeper the the reason it has that name is that although you find it in sort of fields etc it has a very strong tendency to stay close to bushes and hedges and gates for that matter i suppose and a gate is usually in a hedge but what what the reason they do that is is that that the males have the instinct to know that's that that's where they're most likely to encounter a female because the, the female is on the right and you can see it's different than the male um, 
but the female, um, they lay their eggs. They lay, they lay them on grasses, but not just on any grasses. They lay them on grasses that are partly shaded by bushes and shrubs. So that's where the females are going to make for, and therefore that's where, that's where the males hang out. It, if we're looking at it, the, the one on the left is a male, and the male, you can see on the forewings, you can see two brown patches. Now, they are actually scent scales. They, 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 they contain scents. Some butterflies have, have, have scent scales that smell of chocolate and vanilla and lemon, so the same kind of smells that appeal to us. They have these scent, snaps, scent scales. The females don't have them. They also have a slightly paler wing, more orange on the wing. And there's, there's one more thing that you can see best on the female. If you look at that black spot, it's got two tiny white spots in it. Um, and so is the male, except you can't make that out so well there. But when you move to its close relative, the meadow brown, which we will do in a moment, Meadow brown is bigger and it's slightly differently patterned, but one infallible difference is that the meadow, meadow brown has only got one white speck in that black spot where, where the gatekeeper has two. So perhaps we can move to the meadow brown. Here's a meadow brown. Again, on, on this one, you, you, get, you get a sex difference. Um, you, you can see there's only the one, there's only the one speck in the spot. Um, the, the meadow brown has, the one on the left is a male, the one on the right is a female. Now, meadow brown is quite a variable butterfly. Um, you, you can, there's always more orange on the wing in, in a female. Sometimes there's a lot more orange than there is on that one. And usually on a male, there's, a, there's, a, there's very little orange on the, on the male's wing, but usually there is a bit more. So they do vary, and the female butterfly is a bit bigger. Um, and one way of one one way of telling them apart, you know, is is by their behaviour. Because med meadow browns, what they live in grassland, and the males are not perchers; they're patrollers. They're constantly patrolling, and what they do is that they they fly, typically, you know, just to say. 10 or 10 or 15 centimeters above the top of the grass heads but then they constantly dip down into the grasses and then dip out quickly again i don't i haven't seen an explanation of why that is but i would guess that it may well be that newly emerged females might well be down in in the bottom of that grass but if if you watch them you can see that they do that they fly over the grass and they'll dip down they'll come up and they'll go on and they'll dip down again um the the uh, so they're another all, all of these browns they all feed on grasses but they've all got their own particular types that they like situations they like to have them in um but they do all in in, in bottom line they all finish up in in um, finish up eating grasses um we move on to the next one this is this is the this is a ringlet. I think the name pretty much speaks for itself. A very beautiful butterfly. That I think is a female because there's a bit of a difference in the colour. That the the female is sort of chocolate and the male is a really dark chocolate. There's a it's not a huge difference in the shade, but I'd I'd be confident that that's a female. Um, it it um, when I was last in the park, I was looking for the first ringlets to emerge, but I don't think they have yet, unless anyone else has seen one. But the, um, the meadow browns began to emerge a few days ago, and there's just a small handful about. But there'll be a lot more later. Um, usually of any kind of butterfly, the first ones you see are nearly always all males, because they tend to come out a few days before the females begin not absolutely invariable but anyway this is a beautiful butterfly and if you could see the underside you'd see that the the rings the gold you know the gold ring the gold and the black and the white are uh, you know there are more of them and they're more emphatic on the other side um 
so that and um, but when you if you're not sometimes it can be difficult to tell if you're watching a ringlet or a meadow brown if it doesn't settle but ringlets fly over the grass like the meadow ringlet mass fly over the grass like meadow browns do but they never dip down into the grass they fly steadily and never seen one go down I mean, obviously, they, they don't know what they're doing. The male doesn't know what it's doing. It's built in instinct. But I presume that, you know, you're not going to put the speckled wood females don't don't hang about at the bottom of the grass. So if the males were to dip down there, they'd be wasting their time. So I think we could move on to the next one. Now, this this is also a brown believe it or not, the brown, you know, is a, it's a sort of general name for the group because most of them, I think all the others that we have in this country are, are sort of brownish in various forms, but not this one. Um, this, this is a straightforward brown in every, every other respect, the caterpillars eat grass and everything else, um, and, but it's black and white. The, the, uh, the male and the female of this look quite similar if you look underneath, females are very, underneath, they're very slightly yellowish underneath. Otherwise, they're not so dissimilar to the top. Um, more muted, and the, the black is more like a grey. But the, we've only seen the marble white. I've been in the park twice, to the best of my knowledge, and I, I'm the person who's seen both of them. Haven't seen one for three years now, but it's one of those butterflies which is actually spreading quite strongly in the urban area so we live in hope um so if anyone happens to see one and we're just coming up to the beginning of the time when they'll appear and then they'll fly throughout july and into the beginning of august so if anyone sees one we're really pleased to know um because we can't tell if they're just stragglers wandering through or whether or not you know we'll get a female who decide this is a good place to lay her eggs and she'll lay them now, what most butterflies when they lay their eggs they fix them onto some they usually fix them onto the food plant sometimes onto something else which i'll come to later but a few um don't the marble white i think the ringlets as well they simply scatter their eggs in a suitable place they fly over the grass and drop their eggs but what what that might mean is that you can get rid of your eggs faster it, it might reduce their survival chances but but if you've got more eggs out because quite often happens that female butterfly in her life very often won't lay all the eggs she's capable of laying she might either not have finished laying them when she gets to old age or she might be snapped up by a bird you know so the quicker you get them out the better so that's a marble white it doesn't doesn't actually have the spots of the others either does it but um so we we'll move on. Now we're coming. To, we're now coming to another group of butterflies, which is very. Is a, it's a skipper's. It, it's a very worldwide. It's a very large and very widely distributed group with thousands of species. Quite a few of which don't look too dissimilar to that. Um, that that. Um, We've got three in the park, three, three types of skipper um, out of eight that exist in Britain as, as a whole. Um, the, the, uh, they are, the, the male on the left, it, you might think it, it looks exactly the same as a female, but if you look closely, it doesn't. What, what you can see on the female's wings is that, that little sort of circle of blotches towards the base of the wing is is sort of more pronounced than on the male um it's more it's more clearly defined so you 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 can so if you see them you can tell them you you nearly always see the males because and in fact they they have just begun to emerge i've seen three i think so far but they're that what they do they're they're a percher very much classic percher but and what they do is they anything that flies past any other butterfly doesn't have to be its own kind some even a bee probably or a fly they'll they'll up 
they'll fly up at it, you know, and, and often they'll come back to the exact spot that they, they left from. They know exactly which leaf they were on and they'll often come back there. So, and, and they hold their wings in a peculiar way. They're neither closed nor fully open. They're kind of, I think you can see there, they're kind of, the four wings are raised. And I think the other, other thing about telling the male from a female, apart from behavior, because a female doesn't do any of that business. She just gets on and lays her eggs. Um, but you can sort of see, like we saw on the gatekeeper, so-called sex brand, the, these scales that have aromatic scales that act as pheromones to the female. Um, so that's another way of telling the male. But, but one of the things they often do, and, and you, we see this time and time again in the park in the summer, there's a butterfly we're coming to called the comma. And the comma is also a butterfly that perches and flies up ferociously at anything that passes. Um, and you very often find a, a speckled wood and a comma in the same area. But they're both like a place that's in the sun, but sheltered by bushes. Um, and they'll, they'll, they'll be spending all day flying up with one another. They'll fly up and then two minutes later, up they'll go again and down they'll go again. So, you know, that's their particular behavior. And they also, they're also grass feeders. Um, but we'll move on to another skipper now. This is the, we, this is one of the two other skippers we've got. What, one is called the small skipper and one is called the Essex skipper. They are smaller than the large skipper. And on the left, I've just, you know, only shown a picture of it an Essex skipper, because on site like that, you couldn't really tell the small skipper from the Essex skipper. They look the same, they behave the same, they don't behave like large skippers, they don't fly up aggressively, they, they tend to just flutter around, um, not very far above the heads of the grass, and they don't move all that fast, and they settle quite often, but there's there's, there's one easy way of telling the difference between the two species, and that's illustrated in the next picture. You, you have to either catch it or get very close to it. Um, and you'll see that the underside of the antenna has this very distinct black tip on the Essex skipper. On, on the small skipper, it doesn't. There, there isn't that sharp definition. And we, we in the park, I think that generally speaking, the small skipper is a commoner butterfly than the Essex skipper, but we we seem to have far more Essex skippers. And that's, but they're grass feeders too, uh, but they, well, both, both are smaller than the Essex, they cut up the speed on grass, but they, um, what, what they, um, now where was I there with that one? I uh, lost my thread there for a moment. I'll get it back again. Um, yeah, they're both feed on grass, but the, the, the small skipper prefers to feed on grasses that tend to grow in dampish environments. And a, a grass called the Yorkshire fog grass is a, is a favorite. And the Essex skipper favors grasses that grow in dry environments. And the, what they call the Coxfoot grass is, is one of the main ones. So we've got rather more dry and dry grassy environments than we have got wet ones or damp ones. So is probably why we've got many times more Essex skippers than we've got small skippers, but we do have both. Um, the, the one curious thing about the Essex skipper is that it, it lays its eggs in July, but they don't hatch out until the following March or April. They don't hatch out until the following spring, where, whereas the small skipper lays its eggs at a similar time and the little caterpillar hatches out but then it, 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 it makes itself a shell to winter. It doesn't eat anything and it doesn't wake up. It doesn't start eating until spring. Now, that, that's made a very big difference to the, to the fortunes of these butterflies because when Europeans settled in North America, they took animals and they took hay to feed the animals and to feed them while they were traveling to them immediately when they arrived. And that hay, could very and often did contain the eggs. If they went over in the winter, it would contain the eggs of the Essex skipper. So this butterfly is now a pest in Eastern North America where they call it the European skipper. 
but the I think the small skipper with a tiny fragile caterpillar wouldn't have survived, you know. That didn't get to North America, presumably, because any grass that had the small skipper tiny caterpillars in, they wouldn't have made it to uh, to North America. So there's a there's a story. Next, we do the next one. Right, um, we got three common white butterflies in the park, and but we, to save time and all that, I talked about these in the spring. But Ken's put on one slide. Um, the three of them for two, for two reasons. One, so that you can, you know, to tell the difference between them. What we've got on the left is a, is a female large white. Um, now, it's, I know it's a female because they've got two black spots. If it were a male, it would look similar. It would only have one black spot. Um, I think the, and the wingtips in both sexes are quite pronounced. and it, it's bigger than these two ordinary cabbage whites. Um, well, they're not cabbage whites are the wrong term to use, but the middle one is a small white, which is a male, um, one spot. The one on the right is a green veined white, which has got one spot. It's another male, but you can see the the veining, you know, the, the black lines on the wing, which the small white doesn't have. And if you looked at the underside of both of those, you would see just a sort of creamy yellowy underside on the small white with no lines on it and you'd see quite strong lines which which are a sort of greenish black really quite strong lines on the underwings of the green vein white um we, we see all of these quite a lot in the park um the the large white is often you often can't see many but at certain times in the summer which are not predictable you may see a great many. We, we had a session like that last summer. Suddenly you can see 70 or 80 in, a, in an hour's walk. Um, they may have been, some, some of these butterflies, even though they're not, we don't think of them as migrants, they nevertheless, there are often significant migrations taking place, often from Europe, perhaps if populations somewhere build up, then there's a pressure on the surplus to move. Um, so, quite why we get these flushes of large whites and then they'll they'll rapidly go down and there won't be many around. Um, but the large white has a curious habit of spending a lot of time flying high up in the trees. And I don't know why this is. I think it can only be because perhaps that's where the females go and the mating takes place because there's nothing up there for them. There's not their food plant, you know, um, but they nevertheless, they do it. But the small white, if you see a white butterfly flying right out in the open, a long way from any bushes and trees, it's more like it's much more likely to be a small white than a green vein white. But if you see it somewhere where there's plenty of bushes and trees around, and if the butterfly quite often flies into the shade and out again, it's likely to be a green vein white. So the green vein white likes a damper, more shaded sort of plant uh, place than the than the others. All, all of these things eat plants in the cabbage family um, and in fact the large and small white would also eat garden nasturtiums that some gardeners may know e even though they're not in the cabbage family but they've got some of the same chemicals but the small white and the, the green vein white doesn't eat garden cabbages it tends to eat plants like garlic mustard which grow in the woods where whereas the small white will eat garden 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 crops loves cabbages but they, it'll also eat um, things like wall rocket and they're all in the cabbage family so um, I think we can move on to the, to the next slide this is one that there's two here two butterflies here when I did the spring talk I, I, I spoke at more at more length about the brimstone than anything else but I won't do that now it was a lovely shot that one of a male brimstone if it was a female it would be a paler lemony color but talked about now the, the brimstone is an extremely long-lived butterfly um it there at the moment there will be all around the cemetery park on the on buckthorn bushes which is a food plant there will be there will be the chrysalises and possibly in in one to two weeks they'll start to hatch start to see them again um 
and then we will see brimstones until sometime in August. Most of them then go into hibernation, um, but occasionally one will pop out in September, October, or even November, and you might you might see one then. But they'll be sleeping for the winter, often in ivy or holly bushes, which from which you can see you know, the, the leaf shape and the little marks on there, which are part of the proper pattern. They might look as if somebody's been splashing red ink, but uh, they're part of the pattern and they look like perhaps a blemish on a leaf, you know. Um, but you may see these again. If, if you get a very warm February day, they may come out. So you, can, you may see them from February and certainly from March up to, up to the beginning of June. In a cooler spring than this one, you would, you would still be seeing them now, but I think they've finished. But they won't, they'll only have about a fortnight's gap. And then that, so brimstone you can see almost all year if you're lucky. One on the right, brim, brimstones and whites are all in the same family. Um, and so is yeah, and so is the one on the right, which some people might recognise as a clouded yellow, um, if it opened its wings. But they don't. It's what neither of these open their wings when they're resting usually. So they, when they set, they close their wings. Um, the the um, but the upper wings are a kind of stronger yellow colour with more black markings. The the clouded yellow is strictly a migrant. Some come to Britain every year in most years not that many and the best place to see them is usually on the South Downs or the Dorset coast. If you go walking there on a summer's day you're, you're almost bound to see a few but up here we may go years without without seeing one. I, I saw one last year I, about two years before that we had we had breeding in the park we saw some in the early summer and then we saw more in late summer so We've got the food plants for them in the park, so they're clearly bred. Um, they can occasionally be present in huge numbers, but that's very rare. So that's clouded yellow and brimstone. So we move on. Aha, now, this, this, is, uh, this is something that has just begun. The butterfly that is just coming out now, I mentioned it before, the comma. Um, the, the, uh, I've seen the, I think I actually saw the first one on June the 1st, which is, uh, but I saw, the last time I was in the park, I saw four, but we should see an increasing number. They're just coming out from the chrysalis. They, they, they like the brimstone, they also hibernate as a grown up butterfly. And what you can see on the right, you, you look at that very eccentric wing shape and it's, it's um, with a mark underneath that, that gives it its name, um, which is always there. And it, it is a very good match for an oak leaf. And in the winter, it, they're frequent, they're not invariably, but they're frequently found on an oak tree. And as you know, oak trees often hang on to a few brown leaves for all the winter or for a very long time. But, but one of, they've, got a, they've got a peculiarity. The, the ones, if you go in the park tomorrow, any comma you see, will be not one which is going to hibernate. It, it will be a brighter, or we haven't got the top of the hibernating one, but it'll be a brighter orange and the scallop. Oh, oh Judy's gonna turn the phone off. I, I suspect I know who that might be, um, but we'll turn it off. <laughs> Sorry about that, I should have done it before. Thanks, Judy. Anyway, back to the comma. <laughs> um, makes a diversion but the the, the um the scalloping the, the the one the commas that come out now um from eggs laid in the spring they they won't hibernate they will get busy mating quickly and there'll be another brood but and that brood will be um that brood will hibernate but um we'll, we'll also have that um the, the uh, some of the ones that come out when you when you get into July there'll be common eggs that were laid rather later in the spring will not look the same as this they'll they'll look like the ones which spend the winter hibernating 
and they will they, they won't be interested in breeding and they will fly around nectar up and then they'll hibernate and 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 then next spring out they'll come so that that's unique it's only the comma in this country that does anything anything like that um i, I once saw in the park I, I saw something really interesting it was on a buddleia bush and there was a new there, there was one of these commas would have been a female and it was on the flowers and along comes one of the older males which was still still going over overlapping with this new emergence and my god you know he, he just could not understand why she was totally uninterested in his advances absolutely uninterested he was scrabbling around like a mad thing um but she she just ignored him completely and carried on nectaring but she her sexual you know she wasn't sexually mature so you know that was a strange combination um we the comma is uh, is a nettle feeder and we're going to come on to some we'll, we'll come on to the comma soon next one right now the comma and the peacock and a number of other butterflies are, are that they're there they've always for a long time been known to be closely related and in one of the big butterfly families the the browns always used to be placed in a separate family but in the last i don't know how many years 20 30 40 years the scientists have decided that the browns and the you know the peacocks and the commas are actually very closely related even though they look rather different their caterpillars are quite different um but nevertheless and I, I don't know why i don't know what what the reasoning is but i trust it the the, the ones comma and peacock and related caterpillars are always spiny like this which is quite a protection against birds it's not a protection against everything um but it uh, it gives quite a lot of protection but when we look at the in, in fact um I'd asked Ken a while ago to try and get a caterpillar of the peacock. You can see it's on a stinging nettle leaf. And in fact, what the peacock does, she lays a whole lot of eggs together, perhaps, perhaps 50 or 80 all together. So when the little caterpillars come out, they all live, initially they spin a web and they all live within that web. And that web also functions as a toilet and they eat everything in and around it. When they've eaten it, they all move and they make another web. But when they get to a certain size, they stop making webs and they separate a bit, although they all stay in the same general area. So those are, those are fully grown peacock caterpillars. Um, the, um, the comma caterpillars are not, they're not, they feed on nettles as well, but they live one by one. Um, the, Ken told me today, somebody, somebody told me yesterday that they'd seen one of these crawling on the ground. They didn't know what it was, but when they described it to me, I knew what it was. Um, and Ken told me today that, um, in fact, we, we, somebody found a, a group of them on nettles near our compost team. We, we, we expect most years we can find one or two batches of peacocks. So I'm glad that they're with us this year. But the butterflies have now all gone. They flew in the spring, but they will begin probably in the second week of July. You should start seeing peacocks. We don't get an awful lot in the park, but you'll see some. And those, those um, it's another, there's another example of these eye spots here. Now that, those eye spots could well, you know, they could deflect a predator and, and peck at them, but they're, that probably is not how it works because when the peacock's resting, it very often rests with its wings closed and underneath, you can see the black edges underneath the underside of a peacock is completely sooty and possibly its natural hibernating place is in a burnt out tree. I have found them there when I was a child, found three in one tree. But what might happen if a predator comes along and pecks at that, suddenly those wings open and the bird is startled and off goes the butterfly. That, that may well be what happens with the peacock. So um, we'll move on to the next one. Now, th this is one of our, our choicest butterflies. 
that this is a we, this is one of the the few that we've got that are have quite you know are not really um you, that you really wouldn't expect to find anywhere in the inner city um silver wash fertility the picture on the right it, it, it doesn't show the full gleam but there's a kind of greeny and silvery underneath on on the wings which you can see so that that's why it gets its name it's very big it's not our biggest butterfly but it's one of the biggest swallowtail and purple emperor are bigger um but what what you can see on that one is that on the the middle one that that's a female the, the, the black markings on the wings, many of them are joined up. On, on a male, they're not joined up. They're separate black patches and none of them are joined up. So you, if, when you see one settle, you, you can tell if it's a male or a female. Now, on, on the left, there's a caterpillar. Oh, and interestingly enough, it's on the flower of a violet, which I didn't know until the first time I've seen this picture. And it's actually the first... I've seen pictures of a caterpillar in the book, but I've never seen one in real life. It, it, um, its food is violet leaves, and we've got an awful lot of violets in the park. So I think Andy Maguire and I first saw one of these in 2006, and we weren't sure about it. We chased it up and confirmed it. But we've seen one, we've seen them in every year since, except in 2016, nobody saw one. But they must have been still there because they reappeared in 2017. But the, the um, what they do, the females, they don't lay their eggs on the violets. They lay their eggs on the trunk of a tree, which is next to violets. Traditionally, they're supposed to lay them on oak, 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 tree, uh, oak trees, but they will lay them on lots of other things. And I did once have the great good luck to, to actually see one in the park lay its eggs on the trunk of a sycamore tree. Any, anyone who can remember a sycamore tree will know that the bark is most, mostly smooth with little paler grey patches on it. And she was laying her eggs in those paler patches because they're sort of rough and they give a little niches for the eggs to be tucked away in. The, the weird thing about those caterpillars is, is that like the small skipper, they hatch quickly, but they don't come out of their eggshell until the spring. Then they sniff out the violets and they go down the tree and they start eating. So that's so that 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 butterfly will could could be appearing any time from next week onwards. How many we'll see, I don't know. 2018 was the best year. 2019 they were down somewhat, only saw seven or eight in total. Saw about 25 in 2018, which is by far the best. So whether or not what will happen this year, who knows? But they, they actually, the males, they, they glide and soar, you know, in open spaces with, where it's sunny, surrounded by trees. But they're really, really, you know, very powerful flights. So if you see something like that and it's going around, you know, in a great soaring motion, that's what it'll be. So look out for them. They'll, they'll be around, say, from late June into mid-August. Um, so we can move on to the next one. Now, this, it, we hear two, two butterflies, which are among the most familiar butterflies, the Red Admiral and the Painted Lady. Um, the, the Red Admiral, we, you know, we always, we, we, we will, what can we say about the Red Admiral? Well, it's a fascinating sort of butterfly. It's got a wonderful, you know, wonderfully bold sort of pattern on its wings, but underneath, like all butterflies, it doesn't have a bold pattern. Underneath, it's got a camouflage pattern. Um, it often rests like that. And it's, um, in fact, what seems to be the case, I don't know whether any, well, Andy or anyone else will bear this out. I've seen more Red Admirals this, this spring than I usually do, quite a, quite a few more. Not, not masses, but, but sort of dozens rather than just four or five over the course of a spring you usually they don't get going in numbers until about now but the fact that they were the fact that there were a lot of them about earlier might mean that we're in for a really good red admiral summer and they might you might find this is very familiar but this is one of the butterflies that you you might find just absolutely anywhere it, it's an immense traveler it's an immense migrant and a lot of them migrate here but the, they also I don't know how many, but there's always some 
spend the winter in the cemetery park hibernating. But they um, and and they will they when you get a warm winter day, they will come out for a while and and choose the most sunniest sheltered spot they can find and sit there and face their wings towards the sun. They'll they'll often. They won't sit on the grass, they'll sit on a dry leaf because the dry leaf will be warmer than the grass. And, you know, we have had Red Admirals in the park in every single month of the year. Uh, I've even seen one on the winter solstice, which is, you know, if you get a, what you've got to get is one of those perfect winter days when there's no wind, the sun is unimpeded and the temperature's at least about nine degrees. And then you've got to, you go and look for a sun trap and you might find one. The, the, um, the painted lady is a migrant and people know that sometimes the last summer was apparent was a reasonable summer for the painted lady and I remember Jim and Jenya particularly saw one um, the, the uh, it was one of the better summers but it wasn't a classic summer when they're present in enormous numbers about about every 15 or 20 years you get enormous migrations in spring and they breed up and and you can get you know millions upon millions upon millions of painted ladies uh, around the uh, around you know you may see them and sometimes you'll see i i have seen in the park sometimes one day there have been painted ladies everywhere and the next day they've more or less all gone often that's because they they haven't really finished migrating they've gone further north some years they even breed in the Shetland Islands and Iceland. So, and, and the painted lady is one of the most widespread butterflies in the world. It's, I think it's found in most continents um, and it's a huge mover. It's not found in, it, it's not really found in tropical, tr fully tropical reasons, regions, but it's found in Mediterranean regions and possibly just into subtropical regions. And um, so, and it's a very fast flyer. If if you see something on the ground and whoosh, there's a there's a whoosh, and you didn't you know you don't know what you've seen. That was almost certainly a painted lady gone. Um, I think we could move on. Right, we're moving now on to one of the other families of families of butterflies, which is the blues and the coppers and the hair streaks. They're all grouped together in one family. Um, We've got we've got some of these in the park. Um, this is one that this is a holly blue, which as you can say that this is a male holly blue with a sort of clear blue with with, with just a, a thin black edge um, and a white rim all around the side. If it was a female, that black edge would be much more pronounced. You know, it would be a, a real black tip to the wing, so you can tell the difference between a male and a female holly blue. This spring, holly blues were were very common. They were everywhere, and you could see them anywhere in the borough if you hang around for half an hour or less. Um, I think they've now finished for the spring. I have seen one recently, but in about a fortnight, they'll be out again. Um, the second brood, and that will continue to the end of August, with some going on right through September. Um, the on the right, you can sort of see most of a slug-like caterpillar, the brighter, the brighter green there. But in this family, we, we saw the caterpillars of the of, of the, the the silver wash pillory and the um, we didn't see the comet. Did we? we saw we saw the peacock caterpillar, but the uh, so that group all have those spiny caterpillars. This family all have these slug-shaped caterpillars so they're, they're quite small and slow moving and they're, they're kind of they're shaped like a slug is all you can say what holly blue one of the reasons it's so common is it's got a great many food plants but um, but one of the main food plants that it uses in the late summer and autumn is the flower buds of ivy and, and what the, the mother lays her eggs on on when the flowers are open no, when not, not when they're open. She lays them before that. She lays them when the buds are there. And what the little caterpillars do is they go into a flower bud and they eat out its contents and then they move on to another one until they've, uh, 
until they've eaten their fill. And then they turn into a pupa, which spends the winter like that and hatches usually early April or, or later. But um, most years you can see them by the beginning of April and throughout April and May and into, into early June. So the holly blue is one member of that family and we're going to come on to another one now. So we'll, now this, this is, um, this is the, the, the second, well, the holly blue is the commonest blue butterfly. The common blue is the second commonest. It, it, it's got more specific requirements than the holly blue. So you don't, in particular, it needs the right kind of food plants for its caterpillars. So it needs tref, bird's foot trefoil, needs lucerne, possibly clovers, but it has to have those plants where, where it lives. And it lives in open places. It doesn't live at all in the woods. Now, the, the, um, you've got a big difference between the male and the female in that butterfly. On the left, you've got a male. On, on the right, you've got a female. So the male is blue and doesn't have any of those orange spots. The, the female has got not much blue. So some have more, some have less than that. Some people, but they've always, the female always got the orange spots. Um, the, the, uh, I think Ken's got a picture of the underside for me as well. Is that Ken? It might be covered. That it is on that same screen, Terry. He oh, just right. might not be able to see Ken, if your gallery is there. I just, would depends, other, depends how you've got your screen arranged to see. Well, I, I don't. Terry. Doesn't matter if I see it. But I, I, if other people can see it, yeah. what you should have there is the fact that both of them. I don't know which sex that is, but they're similar underneath and. Unlike the holly blue, which has only tiny, tiny little black dots under its wings, that common blue has quite an elaborate array of spots. Um, quite what purpose they might serve, I don't know, because they can't, they're not the kind of thing that are going to deflect a bird or a lizard, particularly. They're not, I don't know what their function is. I've never read it up. But the, um, one, when you see a blue butterfly and you're not sure which it is, if it's flying around trees and bus bushes, it will always be a holly blue because common blues never do that. I've never ever in my whole life seen one fly over a bush. They fly about a meter above the grass usually and they, own, they keep strictly to the open. You might occasionally see the holly blue going across the open too and then you might say, well, what else? can I get closer and see what it's doing? Um, so that's those two. And what's next? I asked myself. Ah, yeah. But this is the this is the butterfly for which we have gained sort of greatest fame in terms of butterflies. This is the this is a small blue butterfly, which um, you, you've got two views there. You've got you've got a top view, and I think that that's a male, and it's a pretty dark on top, and the, the female is in dark. Um, underneath it is blue with those black spots as you can see they're not so different they're rather similar to the black spots underneath the holly blue but the small blue is very tiny and it's got very specific requirements it, it its caterpillars only eat a plant called kidney vetch and the only part of the kidney vetch plant they eat is the young seeds if, you know when they're still soft and green so they're, they're very fussy and their, their life cycle is tied up tremendously with the plant. And kidney vetch is a fussy plant. It'll only grow in very dry, sunny sort of places. And it, if you've got such a place and nobody does anything about it, 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 in two years' time, you may come past and there isn't any kidney vetch because taller plants have gradually managed to swamp it out. So the, the um, So we've got, well... I haven't seen one yet this year, but we've got we've got a tiny population of this, and we're trying to, which, which is unusual. It, it would have made its own way here, but this is one one of the things is that even butterflies which are, which form colonies like this one does, in many cases they know that the that a small proportion, perhaps, of the mated females will will head off and maybe turn up miles away and with a bit of luck 
found a new colony if they happen to have the right conditions there. The, the, um, one of the ways they know that things don't, maybe don't move very far is when, when you get one of these colonial butterflies, what you can do is what they call mark and recapture experiments. You go along one day and you catch some and you put a, you put a certain paint mark underneath the wing and you let the butterfly go and you go catching more each day and you see which ones you recapture. And if you recorded where you found them, you can see how far they've moved from where you caught them last time. And, and you can sort of, and, and, and you can also, well, you can't tell when a but you know, new, new butterflies are dying and coming in or dying and, um, and, and being hatching out the chrysalis all the time. And you may have butterflies flying in from some distance away, but you can get a pretty, you can get a pretty good idea of how much they move. And in some cases, there's a relative of this called the silver studded blue that apparently it's almost unknown for it to move more than a hundred yards from where it was born. But the small blue is known that it will up and go. So we may be, the first one we saw was in 2012. So maybe then or in even several years before we had a, an intrepid female land and finds some kidney vetch and there you are. So, but, and that, but that, that butterfly, the females stick very close to kidney vetch plants. And when they want nectar, they go to kidney vetch or that plant, which is bird's foot trepor. Um, the males don't do that. What, what the males do is hang around in a long grass area, not too far away, away from the kidney vetch. And they keep an eye out for the females. So that's a small blue so we can move on if there's any more to move on to oh yeah another small um i'm, I'm hanging out my smalls um the, the uh, this is a beautiful little butterfly very perky um we, we we see them pretty well every year but never in large numbers but they're a they're small copper you can see why it's called the small copper but there is also a large copper which is, uh, was a british butterfly that lived in the fens but it's been extinct for a long time but you can still see them in you can still see them in france and that they're, they're they're quite spectacular they're, they're not that well they've got a lot of orange on them and they're bigger than that and they're a sort of sky blue color underneath which is extraordinary when, when they fly you see this all alternation of orange and sky blue but the small copper isn't sky blue underneath but it, it's it's perky it it, it sort of set up a territory, rest on a, rest on a flower. Um, if, if a bit later in the summer, you're passing some ragwort, that's a very good plant to look for them on. But I think last year recorded about seven. So you're quite lucky if you see one. Um, we haven't got to double figures for a very long time, but you never know that the caterpillars eat sorrel, which is a plant we'd like to encourage in the park, but we don't, we're not very successful at encouraging it. So we haven't really cracked the secret. Um, so we don't, we don't have a lot of sorrel, but uh, so that, that's another member of this, you know, it's closely related to the blues and the caterpillar looks similar, looks slug like. And so that's the small copper we move on. And, this is your last one, Terry. Yeah, that's right. Now, how are we doing for time? Not, not. Oh, we've we've You've been going gone over. We've been going a long time. I'll, yeah. I'll stop when I've talked. I wanted to show this. This is a butterfly that we've only seen a few times in the park, but it's very elusive. It spends most. It lives on caterpillars. That eat elms. They eat the flowers of elms um, and the developing seeds, but they they spend most of their time high in the treetops drinking honeydew. They don't often come down. And when they do come down, they never, ever, ever spread their wings. But you can see, we, we have this and we have purple hair streak and we've got three other hair streaks in Britain, but we've only got the two in the park. But you can see this white letter, this W um, on there, which is extraordinary really, it gives it its name. But more importantly, a lot of hair streaks have got what is, is more striking in, in some cases than in this one, that they've got like on their hind wings, they've got these little processes that look like a false head. That doesn't look totally and convincingly like a false head, but in some hair streaks, it really does. So that's interpreted as something that gets the bird, which has seen it, 
snapping at that instead of the real head. So, you know, lovely thing to see. And we, we, may, have, we may have a lot of them, but they're so hard to find that um, we're not sure unless you do a lot of searching. Um, so uh, I think that's the end of the pictures. And so I haven't left as much time as I hope to, but uh, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Terry. Um, I'm, let's see what's going on. I can take over for Michelle, because I know Michelle's got something to get to. So if I can find out from her where we got to with any questions, I can then take over the chat and see if there's anything left. So let's have a I look. I think basically we're, we're all good. There was just one question at the very start from Jerry. I don't know if Jerry's still about and wanted to reiterate what, what she was asking, but it was about um, spots on the very first butterfly. And now I can't remember what. The speckled wood? I got the yeah. I just remember it was the three and the four. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can, yeah. Jerry. It was the three yeah. and the four spots, and I couldn't remember which way there's a different behaviour. Well, to suck, yeah, I, I I didn't actually know this until I, I mugged up a bit more on the speckled wood. Um I think that that the the, the ones with three spots are more likely to perch when with the males with three spots are more likely to perch and then intercept any passing female. The ones with four spots are more likely to patrol, to get up in the treetops and go actively looking for. That makes sense? Yep. Okay. Can I ask a question, sorry if no one else is, about what was the, what was the one that, um, the one that ate the violet leaves one that lies, lays on the sycamore? Yeah, the, that, that was the silver wash patillary. Silver wash fertility. Yes. So two, um, so we've got a patch of land on this estate where there are violets. Yeah. It's quite shady. There are sycamore trees. I'm just wondering about whether we should try and influence the cutting. I, 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 I think one of the things I didn't, that's a, I'll tell you why that's a good question, because a lot of the butterflies we've got in the park would be impossible to kind of have as breeding colonies in, in, in a small space in anywhere less than say five or ten acres um, okay. and some of them are not so pussy a red emerald can turn up anywhere and lay on your nettle patch you know a small white can but i think the, the silver wash artillery i'd have to say forget it but they got you know they need the whole they need as probably need as big a space as we've got to persist to form a population and persist there so when you say they lay on does that mean um, so the caterpillar comes down the tree to yep. the violet leaves, violet yep. leaves. But does that mean that the female has to know there's a violet patch? Yes, she, she can detect it. She can detect it. They've got very, I mean, butterflies, one of the things that they often, they, but, butterflies have to lay on the right food plants and the general way in which they do it is through their feet. They've got chemical receptors in their feet. Um, they land and they test. And then if it's right and they think the plant's a good one, then lay an egg. You, you can, the easiest way to see this is with white butterflies. You'll, you'll see them, if you see a white, it may, it, they'll tend to go on low little things close to the ground. You'll see it land on something, fly off. And if you, you know that plant is not in the cabbage family, you, you can be quite certain she won't lay an egg. Um, and because she's picked up, she hasn't picked up the right chemical signal. So chemical signals are what tell her what the food plants are, yeah? Yep. Thanks, and we've got a couple of other questions here in the chat, Terry. Yeah. So um, Hadija has asked, uh, oh, someone else has got the microphone on now. I'm gonna turn, I think it might be Jerry. I've turned her off, that's fine. Okay, I haven't got off, but, uh, oh, it's back again. I'm now, where are we? I haven't got it yet. No, I don't know. I'm getting some feedback here. Sorry, Terry. So we have a, we have a question about um, caterpillars. So we've got someone who's got 24 peacock caterpillars. Yeah. And for some reason, three of them just haven't made it to chrysalis, while the rest have. Do you know why that's something? Well, happens? are they, but are they still alive and healthy? Uh, there isn't that much information. There's well, just a question. What, what I can say is that, you, they don't all 
get to pupate at the same time, even though the eggs were all laid at the same time. That's genetic diversity. So if there's two things, if they if they still look healthy and they're still eating, they they probably will make a chrysalis now. If if they look dead, they've either got a disease and died, or it's possible that caterpillars get very widely parasitized by little little wasps which lay their eggs inside them and eat they start eating their insides but they don't eat the vital organs until the last moment so and and, and what you get instead of a chrysalis and a butterfly is you get a little tiny you get little tiny wasps so it without knowing for sure it you know keep them going if they haven't pupated just keep them going and they will and if there's something the matter with them, it could either be disease or parasites. And then we've got a question about nectarine. So are adult butterflies more generalistic in nectar preference or are there specific flowers, different species? Oh, used? well, 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 that's a good one as well, because I didn't touch on that at all. One of the things is an awful lot of flowers are of no interest to butterflies. They, they plants in the mint, in the mint found some of them are, some of them they can access, but they can access lavender, but they can't access, say, sage or white dead nettle because the shape of the flower is, is, is adapted to bumblebee pollination. The butterflies just can't get there. Um, and they, you won't, in general, see a butterfly on a rose or a chicory um, or a poppy. Because poppies have got no nectar. They've got lots of pollen, but no nectar. So lots of flowers you won't see butterflies on. And... But m most, like I said about the small blue, that they like kidney vetch and apparently they nectar almost exclusively on kidney vetch and birds for treffle, so I read. Um, there'll be the, the brimstone, for instance, will nectar on lots of things. And beautiful, it'll nectar in, I've seen in the spring, we see it nectaring on the primroses and on the bluebells. So, but it, it's got a great favourite. And th this is the plant called Everlasting Sweet Pea. It's a tremendous favourite in the summer. If you, when the brimstones are about, you look for the everlasting sweet pea patch, and you may find one or two or three brimstones on there feeding all day, and that they will feed all day because they're not interested in mating until the spring. So they've got nothing else to do except feed up and get lots of energy for the summer. So if you, I mean, skippers like the flowers of black horehound, but they're not the only things they like. What one thing to do is. When you see a butterfly, see what, it's, see what it is on and make a mental note and see whether you can build up your own comparative, you know, regime. Some, some butterfly books will tell you what some of the particular favourites of certain butterflies are. But generally, most kinds will go to quite a lot of different kinds of nectar. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. So Samaya was asking the question about the um, peacock caterpillars and she has reassured us that the three that haven't um turned into chrysalis yet are very much still alive well that's it's just time because one one of the things about some of these things is that you know plants and animals don't put all their eggs in one basket if you have if you have absolutely simultaneous development you may get some catastrophe befalling all of them or if they all hatch out at the same time and the weather's terrible you know so a spread a genetic spread um, helps to, you know, spread the risks, really. So, Excellent. Thank you, Terry. Well, we've yeah, gone over by nearly half an hour. Congratulations to Samaya on, yes. on bringing them safely through, because yes. one of the things is it's very easy to kill caterpillars by neglect when you keep yes. them. You don't clean them out, you don't give them fresh food, or you put the food in when it's wet, you, yep. you can have a lot of deaths or a complete mortality. Yep. Sorry, can uh -huh. I ask one more question, please? Yeah. Go for it, Samara. Um, so we've had quite a hard time foraging for nettles for them. It's been, it's been, it's been a lot of work. Um, I was wondering, would they eat anything else apart from nettles? No, I think that they may very occasionally eat hops, but um, I think that there are, maybe, maybe for future reference, what, what you should do, because peacocks only have one brood a year, so you won't be breeding them again until next year. Next year. But if you look around your neighbourhood, and look for, you know, you probably can find, especially in sort of neglected corners, mm -hmm. um, you, you probably can find some more nettle patches. 
Would that be a suggestion? That, that you know, then you, you'll make a mental note and next year you'll say, oh, we'll, 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 it'll be easier for us yeah. now because we know more where they're growing. Yes. So, so you're saying that they would only eat nettles? Yes, basically. Yeah. Some things have a range of food plants and there's nothing that will eat anything. Um, although there's one moth in the world that apparently appears to eat anything. Um, but the, the uh, you've got to give them nettles and mm -hmm. you've obviously been doing it right because you've been drying them. If it's been raining, well, it hasn't much, has it? But you can't. We've, you, dry, we've you dried them wet, before. You didn't give them wet, wet food. But mm -hmm. I, I, I can only suggest, I can't believe that you won't find in, you know, somewhere or other. Um, how far do you live from, from the farm, from Stepney Farm? There's, oh, a, lot of, there's a lot yeah. of nettles on there. I mean, I'm sure if we have a look, we will yeah, find you, some. But... but no, you can't feed them anything else, I'm afraid. And the other thing, at this time of year, the nettles are tending to get a bit sort of, you know, a bit tatty. It, the mm. fresher and nicer the leaves you can give them, the better, you know. When, when the leaves start getting tatty, you, you, uh, you know, they may, not, they may not suit the caterpillar's digestion. What, what people sometimes do at this time of year, with the, if they've got a patch of nettles that looks tatty, they cut it down and then it grows up fresh because you could have other, you could have other nettle feeding caterpillars, like red admirals feed on nettles, commas feed on nettles. Commas do have other food plants, but not, not, not peacocks. And, um, you know, you can get your own fresh supply by cutting a patch down in June and it'll come up fresh. And if you've got any caterpillars that need nettles, then you can, uh, you've got some. And I'm um, sorry, very, very last question. Uh, yeah. When we were looking for nettles, we found some that had purple stems um, and some that had green ones. Is there a difference between the two? Not really, I've, I've, but that's a good, that's a really good observation as well, because I think Ken will bear me out on that. Is that because we've got a lot of nettles in the park and mm -hmm. what you find is that one nettle patch when you find a nettle patch it's often all one plant because it has creeping roots it looks like it might be lots of plants but you, you might find a plant where the whole patch the, the stems are green and another whole patch the stems are sort of purplish um, and that's that's a sort of another genetic variation um, I don't know what um, no, I don't think it makes any difference to the caterpillars, although I tend to think that the more purple they are, that they've got a stronger smell than the plain green ones. I don't know whether Ken would agree with that, but uh, yeah. yeah. I often find the red ones are much, I often Sorry. find the red ones are much drier as well. Yeah. They're, um, they're, yeah, yeah. Very different kind of feeling. It, it's something that's obviously important you know, to have that in its have that in its makeup, genetic makeup is obviously important to the nettle, but I'm not sure it's important to the peacock either way, unless right. the leaf is just too, you know, dry and old and uh, indigestible. Yeah. Thank you very much, Terry. Pleasure. Lovely. I think we'll stop there, Terry, because we've gone half an hour over our time yeah. and uh, lots of people have been drifting off already and thanking you for a fascinating and wonderful talk and saying goodbye. So, um, if there is anything burning, say it now. Otherwise, I, you're welcome to turn your, your microphones off and we'll give Terry a round of applause. Thank you very much, well Terry. Thank you. 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 So check out our ticket table site to sign up for that one. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Terry. And I'll see you tomorrow. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.